Hello, we are here today with Dr. Wally Gilbert, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1980 for discovering one of the first methods for sequencing DNA. Dr. Gilbert is an incredibly accomplished scientist. He actually started out as a physicist and became interested in molecular biology after he was faculty at Harvard and met Jim Watson and started working with him on mRNA. Since then, he's made key discoveries in um, how translation works. He biochemically isolated the first genetic control element. Um, he proposed, he was the first to propose the existence of introns and exons. He was the first to propose the RNA world hypothesis. He's made significant advances in biotechnology, um, in recombinant DNA and in cloning, and he co-founded Myriad Genetics and uh, Biogen. And since uh, about the early 2000s, he's actually uh, started in another field, and that's that of photography, where he's become an incredibly accomplished photographer, and he's had over 40 solo exhibits. And we are actually here today in his studio in Somerville, Massachusetts. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I thought we'd just start by, uh, I'd start by asking you how you got interested in photography. In some ways, I've been interested in photography all my life. I used a camera as a child and had a wet dark room and did that sort of photography. But I well, would use a camera to record objects in the world, to photograph a bit as I traveled. I didn't do anything particularly with those images. And I traveled at one time around 2000 in, um, in Italy. And the photographs I took up with on that trip and a trip in uh, Egypt before that struck me as very, very lovely. And I began to explore whether I could make large images from those. And in those days, it was a two megapixel camera. People insisted that you could not make a large image. It was suitable only for sort of postcard sized images. And I was assured by everybody that I couldn't make large images, but I simply tried to do it and discovered that, one, it was very, very easy to do, and that the large images had an emotional impact that the small ones didn't. And so I began to do it, the photography seriously as an art form. At first, I would show it just to friends, and um, people began to buy some of the, buy some of the images. And a professor, um, Jan Kiewicevich at the Massachusetts College of Arts saw some of the images and gave me an art show in 2004. And we did a very large show down at the Mass College of Art. And that included uh, 8 foot by 12 foot images. And I've been doing art, the art more and more seriously ever since. We did a very large installation in Poland, again, created through Jan Kubasevich and a friend of his, um, suit. Um, friend of his in Poland, who had an access to a site in the middle of Warsaw that was an ancient factory and now was used, at then was used somewhat as a art display space. And they invited me to come and photograph in the factory, thinking we'd do some sort of installation. I went and photographed, and then we created installation with eight foot by 12 foot hangings of the photographs of fragments of machines hung throughout the factory and about 30 two by three foot images. And that display was up in Warsaw for two months and then again in Łódź and in Poznan. It's been put on again several places. Then you moved into more abstract art? Then I moved from these fragments of machines to a set of photographs of ballet dancers. I was invited to illustrate a book that a friend of mine, Christine Temin, wanted to write about the Boston Ballet. Uh, so I photographed ballet dancers in rehearsal for several years. And those photographs are quite beautiful. And they are very lovely people and lovely bodies, lovely, lovely motions. But that led me from photographing the people to making abstract images from the dancers. And that led me into a series of abstract works, of which one of them is here behind you. These abstract, I spent a year sort of working with these abstract forms. First, these abstract forms based on a human face created 
moved into more and more strange color spaces and pattern spaces. And then I spent another year or so working purely in abstract forms based on geometric figures, squares and triangles and lines. And we have actually a show up right now in Germany in Lindau, in the museum there, of those abstract, geometric abstract figures. And in the re more recent years, I've gone back to pure photography and I do photographs of black and, w and black and white and very brilliant color. And I have no idea what I'll do next. What made you decide to explore different mediums? Um, it's again sort of constant curiosity. The, I mean, it's again one of those similarities between the curiosity that drives one as a scientist, which is a curiosity about the world. And if you're driven by that curiosity, you change the mediums that you work in. You change what you're doing. You change the technologies you use. And so I find it perfectly natural to explore different media. So many people think of art and science as being two completely separate things. Uh, what do you think about it? I think they both I find great similarities between the art and the science. I find that the creative drive is very, very similar. And the fascination with the, what is new, both in science and art, drive is a creative drive to create something new. In science, we try to create something that's new and new fact about the world, something that's new and different and true and beautiful. In art, we try to create something that's new and beautiful and true. The stress in the art is on the beauty. The question of truth is a much more minor one. The stress in science is on truth in the sense, and it's a socially defined form of truth in which the rest of the world has to agree that what we found, our theoretical idea or our experiment, can be built upon or can be reproduced. The art is a lot more individual than the science, and the rewards are in the effect the art has on the viewer. The rewards in science are finding something that's new again, passing that knowledge on to the world. I'm laughing because I was also thinking of another view of science. Of you, um, Al Hershey was a great scientist and used to just talk about Hershey Heaven. Hershey Heaven was having an experiment that worked and doing it over and over and over again. And some people do art that way. They find an art form that works and they do that over and over and over again. I have a slightly different cast of mind. I generally can't bear to do things over and over again. I constantly go on to do something different. And that was true both in the science and the art. I could never, never continue, continue doing the same thing in science for very long. And uh, that, led, that had problems, I should say. That has grant problems and all sorts of other problems. But I'd be constantly trying to do something different in the science. And I find myself doing something different in the art. So has your time as a scientist influenced the way you approach doing art? I was originally a theoretical physicist. And a theoretician tries to understand the world in a grain of sand and in something that you can sketch on the back of an envelope. I then became an experimental biologist. And an experimenter has a somewhat different view of the world in which you're trying to find the world through struggle with it, through experimentation rather than through necessarily through broad concepts. The art that I do, I think of as an experimental art rather than a conceptual one. I'm not trying to conceive of broad ideas that I could have somebody else do because they could be outlined to them. I find the photography sort of constantly renewing. I find the art, as I do with the computer, almost a constant experiment, almost like an experiment in science. I treat the computer program and the computer as an experimental instrument. I build the art up piece by piece as an experimentalist, creating forms in the computer either based on a photograph or based on a drawing, and continuing until I find something that I like. And when I find something I like, keeping a copy of it and going on to see how else I could modify it. It's a very experimental approach. 
You've been very successful in many different areas, uh, first as a theoretical physicist, and then as a molecular biologist and biochemist, and then you went into biotechnology, and now you are an successful, successful artist. Um, do you have any keys to success or advice that you give to people who are interested in transitioning? The, I do think that people do, do not change what they do enough. Uh, it's often far easier to change what you're doing than people imagine. Very often people think they've been trained to do a certain thing. We run across students who feel we're being trained to do something, there should be a job just in that thing I'm being trained for, waiting for me, and that's the future of my life. It's very important to realize that the real role of our education is to teach us how to think broadly as opposed to think just about particular topics. The PhD degree is a exercise in how to think, how to reason for yourself what is true. And I learned that when I changed from physics into biology. I'd done a PhD in physics, in theoretical physics, and now suddenly I found myself doing experiments in biology. I realized that the underlying ability that I'd learned in doing the PhD, how to think about how to convince myself something was true or how to test some ideas for myself was the crucial element. And the element in doing the experimental biology was a level of experimental technique that I could learn very easily and facts that I could ask somebody else about. But the real question of how you put something together was something I had learned much more broadly as part of the PhD. I don't think people realize that enough. People spend five years getting a PhD and think it must mean that it takes five years to learn how to do anything different. But in fact, the five years, or six years in this country, is mostly spent in gradually learning how to reason for oneself, and decide for oneself what is true. And that's not something we teach very effectively. We teach it by example. We teach it by a sort of guild system, putting people to we're gradually questioning them, gradually letting them struggle and find the answers. The actual material that's involved is something that one can master within a year or a few months, but the ability to work with it is what takes the time to develop. And once that ability is developed, it can be moved to other fields. So it's much easier to change fields than people, people imagine. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us today. And I guess we'll just end by, um, could you tell people where they can find your work online? If you look me up online as well, like Gilbert, uh, you'll find uh, my websites listed and their sort of photography. I'm not the silversmith and I'm not the baseball player, but otherwise you'll find me that way. 